All right. Welcome everyone who is joining us. Um, I am so excited um, to invite you here this evening. I'm Harmony Bench. I'm Associate Professor of Dance at The Ohio State University. Um, and I'm really excited to um, have you here with us today for This Is Where We Dance Now, COVID-19 and the New and Next in Dance on Screen. This symposium is connected to a special issue of the International Journal of Screen Dance that I'm guest editing with Alexandra Harlig. Please note that at the conclusion of the symposium on March 20th, or if you are in Asia or Australia, the morning of March 21st, um, we invite you to join the editorial board for an informal conversation, brainstorming future directions for the journal. We've also set up a Google Jamboard with um, questions related to both the symposium and the journal where you can leave insights and ideas. For those of you who have used this format before, you know that it is highly editable. Um, so I've left some instructions, but please exercise some caution. I'll, I'm gonna post the link in the chat as we start uh, getting going here. We've also tried to mitigate against any Zoom bombing by having everyone register in advance and enabling the waiting room. Um, but we've also prepared a webinar to jump over to just in case we need to. I'm really hoping that this is good and we can be here in community together. For those of you who are interested in live tweeting, I'm also going to um, paste the Twitter handles for our speakers today um, in the chat. Um, and there are no, nobody has asked for any um, uh, restrictions on, on, on live tweeting. Uh, please do use the hashtag where we dance now. And we ask that you use the Zoom chat to share resources and ask questions um, and that the back channel conversations that I know that we, we sometimes love to uh, have in these Zoom uh, symposium situations, we ask that those happen on Twitter or elsewhere just so that we can keep track of questions for this round table um, in that chat area and the sharing of resources. Before we launch into this first event, I would like to recognize the people who've made this gathering possible. The symposium is part of audiences and online reception before and after COVID, which is a year long series of online events that examines the impact of COVID-19 and quarantine experiences on, art on artistic and cultural production. It is made possible through a global arts and humanities discovery theme special grant from the Ohio State University um, so we extend our, our enthusiastic um, uh, gratitude to them for sponsoring. I also thank Alex Harlig, my co-editor and co-convener for this uh, series of events, for her enthusiasm and support. Um, Omari Motion Carter, who will be um, moderating the roundtable tomorrow on Screen Dance Futures. I hope you join us again for that. Uh, I also thank Lindsay Vader for her behind the scenes organizing and moderating. Uh, the OSU Department of Dance and the editorial board for the International Journal of Screen Dance. We did not receive any accommodations requests for this event, so if you were unable to make a request in advance, please privately message Lindsay Vader, Vader with a V like Darth Vader, uh, and she'll do her best to assist you. We are recording this roundtable discussion and posting it to the journal website, and we'll also publish an edited version in the journal. We do invite you to pose questions for our panelists in the chat as they arise along the way, but there is gonna be an official Q&A period at the end. Um, in the interest of time, we're not gonna read everyone's bios. Um, we invite you to visit the website. Again, I'm gonna put it in the chat here in just a second um, to learn more about each of our presenters. So some of you know that exactly one year ago, uh, my book, Perpetual Motion, Dance, Digital Cultures, and the Common was published. And almost immediately upon its publication, uh, much of the world found itself on lockdown. And artists of all persuasions were pivoting to join existing online communities in delivering screen-mediated content. When I proposed this special journal issue and symposium, I confess that I was a little worried that we would be long past the pandemic and that what we have gathered to discuss would already be passe. Little did I realize that the reason for our convening over these next two weekends would be to grapple with what it means to make and practice dance on screen in the midst of a pandemic that has claimed over two and a half million lives globally. If I might invite a moment of reflection, I would like to acknowledge those we have lost. I would also like to acknowledge 
though the place where I'm speaking to you from is the ancestral and contemporary territory of the Shawnee, Potoatomi, Delaware, Miami, Peoria, Seneca, Wyandotte, Ojibwe, and Cherokee peoples. I would also like to acknowledge that the violence of settler colonialism and its connected legacies of enslavement are global and that they are ongoing and that these legacies are connected to our current health crisis. So I'm really grateful to be here with you today for this symposium and over this and next weekend as we collectively consider where, how, why, and under what conditions we dance now. And with that, I will turn the time over to Alex Harlick. Thank you, Harmony. Hi, everyone. I'm Alexandra Harlick. I'm very excited to be moderating tonight as we discuss uh, dance on TikTok and other short form video platforms uh, as they have developed over the last year in particular. Uh, presenting tonight are Crystal Abedin, Trevor Buffoni, Kelly Bowker, Colette Elois, Julian O, oh, and Pamela Cranbuehl. They will each give short remarks and then I'll pose some questions to them. And then as Harmony said, we'll have some time for questions from um, you all at the end. Uh, so Crystal, can you start us off? Hi everyone, just checking that you can hear me. Thank you. Uh, my name is Crystal Lebedin. I'm Associate Professor of Internet Studies here at Curtin University. My research area primarily focuses on online visibility, internet celebrity, as well as social media pop cultures. And in October last year, I founded the TikTok Cultures Research Network that is at the moment based in the Asia Pacific, but we're hoping that with more resources, we'll get to be able to meet some of our lovely friends from across the globe. So here are five provocations on TikTok based on my forthcoming book, uh, TikTok and Youth Cultures coming out next year. First, let's think about curation. On TikTok, the audio meme is the sorting vehicle or the organizing principle for content. So what this means for a lot of performers, especially for myself as a trained musician, is that we tend to connect the memory of the audio to the bodily performance. So if you hear something, immediately some people break into muscle memory and perform that TikTok dance. And that primacy of audio over the physical and the fleshiness is quite interesting. So think about this as earworms leading the way and shaping how we make use of dance on TikTok. Second provocation in relation to creation. On TikTok, technical expertise is really important for visual narrativity. We think about transitions, cuts, the vernacular of trends. We've got a whole layer of celebrity on TikTok whose expertise is teaching people how to do these cuts and transitions. And the knowledge share of the performance of the app, of all the technical knowledge and skills, is an add-on in relation to your knowledge of dance and performance. So there are people who may groom both different sets of expertise, and then there are people who can bring both together and end up being TikTok stars. Provocation three looks at competition. You may remember that on, in, on um, TikTok, you are able to click into an audio meme and look at all the traceable histories of videos that have used a sound. And that traceable history tends to foster competitive ranking. Most of the time, the first video in the audio meme stream is the originating video. And thereafter, all the other videos are not sorted chronologically neither are they sorted by order of the popularity, but rather in batches. So in the first batch, you see those who've got a million, uh, millions of engagements, followed by 500k and above, 100k to 500k, so on and so forth. And creators who are posting TikTok videos are competing within each of these tiers in order to be seen. What happens here is there's often a lot of conversation and wrestling over people trying to step over each other in the rank or play within their ranks. So to put this more cheekily, if I cannot play with the kids in the big leagues and the millions of followers, I'm just going to remain amateurish and play within my league and become the big fish in a small pond rather than worm my way and be the little, little fish in the very big pond. Provocation number four looks at circulation. On TikTok, remix cultures are built into the platform norm. My friends, Mick Jung, 
Jian Shi as well as Bondi K wrote a paper describing creativity on TikTok as a type of circumscribed creativity, where all the features of the platform shape you to create content in specific ways. So while you believe and think you've got flexibility, this platform is really squishing you into a template and teaching you how to perform creativity within a box. Now, the consequences of this platform norm is that ownership and authorship is often in tension with spreadability. On the one hand, you see people performing, feeling so happy that millions of people are using their dance. On the other hand, every half an hour, there are people calling out each other for not um, crediting them, not acknowledging them. Sometimes the most menial things like a hand sign that goes from the left to the right showing a twist have TikTokers coming up in arms with each other going, you stole my idea, you stole my move. And we're now breaking down to these micro interactions and micro wrestles of ownership for even the most mundane of bodily symbols. The fifth and last provocation looks at commerce. On TikTok, visibility does not naturally convert to celebrity or leverage. And this is because in this platform, post-based virality takes precedence over persona-based virality. You will see that there are lots of lower end mid-tier TikTok accounts who've got one or two viral videos and the rest of their content not registering anything. And in order to get a lick up in that game, they just end up repeating the same tweak or the same format of that one viral post over and over. And to try and circumvent the algorithm, they try their very best to blend this core originator viral video with other trends, but they can never really stay far, stray far away from the one trick pony that got them viral in the first place. So that's me. We've got curation, creation, competition, circulation, and commerce. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much, um, Alex and Harmony, for having me today. Um, I'm going to drop my some info in the chat, but I'm Trevor Buffoni, and I'm in Houston, Texas, and I um, do work on Dub Smash mostly, but I also do work on TikTok as well. And um, I'm also a Dub Smasher. I dance with my students. I'm on TikTok. I dance all over. Um, and so tonight, I want to talk to you all about Dub Smash, a TikTok. Just kidding. Just kidding. Dub Smash, a dance challenge app that quickly became one of the most popular social media dance places among Black teens in the US in October 2018. Oh, wow. Okay. In my upcoming book, Renegades, Digital Dance Cultures from Dub Smash to TikTok, I interrogate the roles that Dub Smash, TikTok, social media, and hip hop music and dance play in youth identity formation in the United States. It explores why Generation Z, or so-called Zoomers, use social media dance apps to connect, how they use them to build relationships, how race and other factors of identity play out through these apps, how social media dance shapes a wider cultural context, and ultimately how community is formed. These Black Zoomer artists, and we're going left or right, Jalea Harmon, who was the one that created the Renegade Dance, uh, Brooklyn Queen, Kayla Nicole Jones, and my high school students at the bottom, and you can see me in the back dancing, uh, have become key agents in culture creation and dissemination in the age of screen dance. They are some of today's most influential content creators, even if they lack widespread name recognition. Their artistic contributions have come to define a generation, and Renegades tells their stories. We're in the middle of a major cultural moment in which Zoomers are stirring change through social media performance. This was no more apparent during, than during the summer of 2020. As the pandemic waged on and the country became engulfed in the renewed Black Lives Matter protests following the murder of George Floyd, one thing became abundantly clear. Dub smashers had mobilized. They were making moves on the street in much of the same way they had been doing on social media. And as always, they advocated for racial justice through screen dance. With a platform comes great responsibility and these Zoomers did not back down. Dub Smashers attended BLM marches and used their social media platforms to elevate Black voices. At the same time, there was a new dance challenge in the works. On June 5th, and here's the dance challenge in the, in the, in the chat. 
On June 5th, the Dub Smash Instagram account posted a collection of dubs set to the song Black Lives Matter by Day Day. The primary dance, uh, choreographed by well-known dub smasher Naya Got Curls, had all the hallmarks of a viral dance challenge, combining standard Zoomer dance moves such as the woe, the wave, and the clap, with moves invoking BLM, which you can see here, such as freezing with one's hands up and the black power fist. At the end of the dance, Naya holds out her hands, inviting in viewers before the words hashtag Black Lives Matter appear. And if you click on that link, there's a collection of, of different dubs of different people doing this, this challenge. While other dancers offered their own spin on the challenge, Naya's version gained the most virality, likely due to her popularity on Instagram and Dub Smash. Even so, nearly every version of the dance featured the hands up and featured the black power fist, marking these dance moves as an essential part of the viral dance repertoire in the wake of the continued oppression of the black community at the hands of white supremacy. The hashtag Black Lives Matter dance challenge conveys how this cohort of black teens uses dub smash dance trends and aesthetics to push against mainstream notions of civility and identity. These dancers use digital platforms and hip hop culture to push against the pervasive whiteness and corresponding white supremacy in mainstream US pop culture as seen on other apps where clicktivism and black squares are the norm. In 2020, this was even more apparent. Dub smashers were not going to let this moment pass them by. Even though they may be young, this is the world they've grown up in, and it's the one they're ready to transform. Having a viral social media platform was unthinkable when I graduated high school and redacted. Yet this is the reality of dub smashers and other members of Gen Z who are coming of age in a digital world. They're not just the next generation of activists, artists, and influencers. They are the present. And as this collective work reveals, the revolution will be dub smashed. Thank you. I guess I should have unmuted myself first. I could talk while I was trying to share the screen. Um, so hello, I'm Kelly Bowker. I'm a graduate student at the University of California, Riverside. Um, and part of my dissertation is looking at the video game Dance Central um, as it was originally created for the Xbox using the Microsoft Connect. Um, one thing that I examined in that study is the way there was this language of authenticity that got circulated with the game. So these first two comments on the screen from press, if you're serious about learning new dance moves, buy Dance Central 2. If you're looking for the true dancing experience, Dance Central 3 is the boogie machine for you. And um, from the game's creators, they can do it in their living room and learn a real skill. And that way, when I go to the, my next wedding, where I used to sit out, I can actually do a few things. Um, and so my concern was that there's this, this language being attached to it in terms of like this really teaches you to dance uh, while the choreography for the game is actually very tailored because of the technology and the Kinect tracking system does a really poor job with the dance styles that are performed in the game. So I've got screen captures from YouTube from left to right of the choreographer um of a particular dance in the middle an avatar and on the right uh, a woman performing the dance who notes in her youtube comments that she gets a hundred percent and kind of labels herself as a as an expert she says i'll show you how to get a hundred percent right so looking from left to right you can see that the movement becomes less angular more vertical um, in other words the africanist aesthetics are being evacuated from the dance and that happens throughout the dance, throughout the game. So we see the choreographer with this kind of extreme lean and deep knee bend, the avatar a little more vertical, and then uh, our gamer is almost completely upright. Um, and one of the things about this is this, this particular gamer, she has over 3000 subscribers on YouTube. She has over 500 videos this morning. She's still active. This morning she posted a video um, that, when I saw it was only four hours old, already had 36 views, 11 likes, and four comments. Um, so there's this ongoing community. And my questions in relation to this talk today are in terms of TikTok, like does the game continue 
and how does the game continue to circulate? Um, does this rhetoric of authenticity that game creators and early press tied to the game continue to be picked up or get picked up by game players? And then how does the movement change when the game moves to TikTok? And so the game certainly is on TikTok. Um, people post screen shares of them playing the game, like the one on the right. People post videos of them doing the dance moves. Sometimes it's really clear that they're playing the game. They're looking past their phone at a screen to know what move to do next. A lot of times they're doing the moves from memory though. They've done these dances so many times. Um, and so the, the video on the, video is not the right word, sorry. The screen share on the right, um, they've got the hashtag 2000s nostalgia seven. And you can see this kind of community that's being created because they post their next video based on the comments that people um, respond to their previous videos yet of what songs they want to see next. So you can see they included this comment at the top here, um, move your body, been asking. Like I've been asking you to do this dance. And so here they are performing the dance to the song, move your body. Um, and their, I think their hashtag really kind of captures the essence of what a lot of the members of this community are interested in is this nostalgia for this game that they played as a kid. A lot of people talk about how when a certain song comes on, they just, they do the moves, they know them from memory. Um, and also that a large number of young women had a crush on this particular avatar. So there's that. Um, as far as this kind of rhetoric of authenticity, I would say that yes, it does get attached to the game as it continues on in TikTok. This um, woman's caption at the top says, y'all talking about just dance, but can we please acknowledge the most underrated and superior game, Dance Central? And a few of the comments on her video say, yes, Dance Central was better. You had to use your whole body. Finally, it was actually choreography. I love it so much. And Dance Central had the real dances. Um, and these kind of comments appear not just on her video, but on other Dance Central videos. A lot of people note that this is how they learned to dance, that they do these moves at the club. And one particular person learned an entire Dance Central dance, auditioned for the dance team, and was accepted. Um, so I'm going to go back a slide for a second. So as far as my question about whether or not the African aesthetics get evacuated in the same way on TikTok, this is like a super early delve into this area for me. But, but I'm thinking that something different might actually happen because there does seem to be so much communication amongst this community. So again, if you look at the, the video, um, of the screen, you can see super tiny, small up in the right hand corner, there's this little box with a silhouette in it. That is the silhouette of the dancer as it's being recorded by the Kinect. Um, and in one of the videos that I looked at, people were just ripping this dancer to shreds in the comments, like you're off beat, you're not even doing the dance. Um, and so while the feedback system of the Kinect might score someone to get 100%, the feedback of the community might give them different feedback. And um, that is where I'm going to end with for today. Thank you. That I'm learning so much. <laughs> that was great, Kelly. Um, hello, my name is Colette Elwa, and I'm a student um, along with Kelly at the University of Riverside in the dance department, um, getting my PhD in critical dance studies. I'm in my third year and I am there researching pre-colonial cosmologies and ontologies of African diaspora dance forms. I'm studying this because of the way it will help scholars to have more informed and broader understandings of dances that show up on screens like TikTok. Um, one of the things that I really wanted to bring up in terms of TikTok, the TikTok screen, was the dance craze, um, Jerusalem. I have to sing it, otherwise I can't say the word properly. But this was written by Master KG um, with the vocals by Zikode. And 
the dance, the song itself was already popular, but it was the dance challenge that happened on TikTok that brought its popularity to biblical proportions. Um, yes, it had 85 million Spotify. And here we'll see, this is the, the picture of the dance group in Angola who they just casually were, got together and were, were eating and relaxing and then got stood up and did this um, kind of line dance. And it is this line dance that turned into a dance challenge. So this step that they're about to do now ends up in almost everybody's dance challenge step, but the dance challenge step is, um, has wide variations. But in any case, there was 85 million Spotify streams of this, 1 million views, um, 1 billion views on TikTok and 800, and 12 million dance creations um, came about as a result to this um, TikTok. And so one of the things that this all brought up for me is someone who is researching um, African diaspora dance and connecting it back to those meanings pre-colonial. And the things that I have found is that in, in our rooted dances and dances of Africa, dance can be understood as a kinetic medicinal frequency. And so in this way, the TikTok screen allows for what I have come to call the congregational global body. So this global body is not limited to the church. The congregational global body lends its concept from the aura or the dancing body and pre-colonial ideas of the body in Yoruba spiritual dance, where the body is not just the individual, but the congregational body, including dancers, singers, musicians, and audience members engaged in raising positive energy. This congregational body is facilitated by the social media screen. The congregational global body of Jerusalem Jerusalem. See, if I don't sing it, I can't say it. <laughs> it um, that body, it speaks, it votes, it signifies life, unity, and humanistic values. This is what the dance challenge has come to mean. It shuns the power of fear and even illness. It forwards inclusivity and individuality. It embraces sexuality, joy, and engages it through body, mind, and spirit. This is what I've come to understand after watching an hour of these videos. They, I mean, they go on forever. Churches came together to um, do the dance. A congregation in Mumbai, um, their whole congregation did the dance. It got 61,000 61, views. And as a result, the, pre, the priest said that doing this dance for his congregation represented university, um, unity and diversity. Another parish on a different congregation quoted biblical verse, Jeremiah 316, saying that uh, we, which says that we will dance again. So this is what I'm sharing in terms of um, TikTok and dancing on screen. Yes, oh, thank you. And, Thank you, Harmony, for adding that. And yes, we will be doing the, our next Back to the Root conference on the 21st. So please check it out. It's always great. We always have a different traditional dance from a teacher, a practitioner who's like has 25 years of experience and we bring scholars and authors to come in and comment on these dance forms. So our next one will be very exciting and check out the link to find that. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Chuyan Oh. I'm an assistant professor of dance at San Diego State University. So today I'm gonna talk about TikTok dance challenge with an emphasis on the face based on my current book project. TikTok, as you already know, is a newest short video sharing app best known for hashtag dance challenge. Although it is unclear when and who studied the trend, it can be traced back to fall 2019. And since COVID-19 outbreak in December 2019, the time users spent on TikTok was doubled, and it became the most downloaded app of 2020 with its increasing popularity to cope with pandemic-related anxiety. So as Cheryl Dawes and Colleen Hooper explained, face is the central part of human expression and identity. 
For them, facial choreography refers to a preferred facial expression and convention in each dance style, often enhanced by video editing. Example could be the highlighted aggressive facial expression of African-American cramping dancer at So You Think You Can Dance. So when applying facial choreography to TikTok, I argue that there's a rise of face dance. So face dance differs from facial choreography because face is no longer an adjective facial that elaborates choreography. So on TikTok, it is the face that is dancing and the dancer is open the face that is at the center of the attention. So while choreography implies professionalism, dance can refer to more inclusive activity that everyone can do from ritual to street festival. And it can be spontaneous amateur activity like many social dances. So TikTok Dance Challenge as a social dance prioritize socializing and popularity instead of doing the dance right. It mostly consists of simple movements such as body roll or swaying hips in a regular tempo, not too fast, not too slow, an easygoing way. It is usually recorded by one camera, one shot, focusing on the upper body portrait, front driven, within a limited space like bedroom, and within a limited time like 15 seconds. So from proscenium theater, movie screen, television, computer, and then to tablet and smartphone, the stage actually gets smaller and it is even mobile because the audience now watches a video on the go. So today we watch dance on the smallest stage, I think, in the history of dance, which doesn't require the previous holistic viewing in theater. So in that challenge, when everyone is doing the same movement without multiple camera, without enough time or space, the best way, one of the best ways to stand out as an individual is to focus on face dance. That include flirtatious wink, naive happy smile, biting lips, rolling eyes, smirking with shoulder shrug, or grimacing and more. So face dance expresses emotional variety within 15 seconds, such as curiosity, boredom, excitement, awkwardness, just being cool, or a self-pleasure that resonates with a private intimate moment of orgasmic sexual ecstasy. So face dance is quick, whimsical, and drastically changing every second and unpredictable so that the audience doesn't swipe up. TikTok dance challengers keep the body movement at the same, but they play with the face with a great deal of improvisation and thus individualization. It has been rare to see face dance. Examples could be a proud natural smile after a successful completion of the Ritu Fuete in Swan Lake Ballet, or Cat Darcy grimace during the sharp, passionate footwork in Flamengo, or the subtle, uncomfortable, vulnerable face of a postmodern dancer who just walks onto the stage being naked without any sound, or a father who is dancing with her daughter at her wedding ceremony whose smile says more than happiness. So I argue that TikTok dance is actually imitating that fleeting authenticity of face dance that is hard to capture. But we know that they would stop smiling as soon as they stop recording. So although it looks improvisational and raw, it is still a choreographed authenticity. So during the pandemic, people across the globe suffer from lack of clean water, hygiene products, unsafety, and domestic violence and racist attacks. But in this crisis, we might wonder why there are so many smiley, happy, light-skinned girls dancing in luxurious bedrooms. So future studies can investigate the neoliberal capitalism and social media algorithm that supports racial, gender, and class privilege and how it affects monetization, celebrity, culture and dance labor on social media after COVID-19. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. So I am Pamela Cranbuell. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Washington Tacoma. And as I prepare my screen share, I just want to let you know that um, I feel really lucky to be going last because I feel like some of what I'm going to talk about here really wraps together um, the threads of what previous folks have talked about. So hopefully this can help you uh, formulate your questions for us in the Q&A. All right. Uh, can everyone see my slides? Great. Okay. Um, so first, let me just extend my gratitude to Harmony and Alex for both organizing this expansive multi-day truly international symposium uh, and for inviting me to speak alongside this set of accomplished colleagues. Um, I want to offer one last disciplinary perspective, that of a dance media historian who tends to take the long view. So given that, I want to briefly discuss two of my own avenues into making sense of short form dance on these apps. Uh, and to keep the scope manageable, I'll be focusing on TikTok. So my two avenues are medium and, and or platform specificity and restaging old phenomena. And I'll talk about each one in turn. So first, medium specificity is a film and media studies concept inherited from art historians that asks essentially, what is unique about X medium? What forms or aspects of human expression does X medium allow or disallow? And in this case, X medium could be painting, photography, film, sculpture, et cetera. For our purposes here, I'm interested not in the larger medium of the computer, too big, or even the much smaller category of the smartphone, app smartphone application, but the, rather the short form video app specifically. Um, so my question becomes, what is unique about these platforms? Uh, and to drill down even further to our topic today, what unique affordances and constraints are given to or placed upon dance by short form video platforms like Dub Smash and TikTok? For those of you steeped in technology studies literature, you'll recognize this term affordances from Janet Murray's work on the digital medium. She defines them as basically properties that allow particular uses. But I'm more interested in TikTok's constraints. Uh, which will echo some of what we just heard about. So here are two of its major limiting factors. First, that TikTok videos are limited to 15 seconds uh, or up to 60, but it's worth noting that the platform originally had the 15 second limit. So that tends to be the one that everyone cleaves to. And second, the forced vertical or portrait orientation of the app. You can't flip it sideways as you can with many other applications. So these constraints play perhaps the biggest role in shaping dance style and choreography on the platform. Choreographers construct simple sequences of movement in order to stay under that 30 second marker. And in the limited space of a portrait oriented phone screen, amateur dancers can learn and replicate these simple sequences. As Chiyun just discussed, the common thread in TikTok choreographies is a focus on the face, but also the hands, arms, hips, and butt. Uh, footwork is, uh, rare, and so are full body dances. So the age-old complaint of non-dancers having two left feet, not a problem on TikTok. So in the context of COVID-19 and its various lockdowns, we've seen millions of new users flock to the app. So these constrained dances with lots of elbow hits, as if they're hitting the edge of the screen, right? Um, these constrained dances have been performed by increasingly numerous and diverse people. So I want to argue that they collectively constitute a performance of entrapment, mirroring our shared experience of being stuck at home, in my case, for over a year now. And these dancers are all similarly stuck within the frame of their smartphone camera, which is usually propped up or mounted somewhere and notably not moving. So instead of an expansive stage or dance floor, a small rectangle within one's bedroom, bathroom, kitchen, or porch is the only allotted space for embodied expression. And it gets viewed on loop, much like our days in front of Zoom, am I right? So my second avenue here is about restaging old phenomena. Today, uh, as many American critics have pointed out, Dub Smash in the US essentially functions as a space where black youth create and develop dances within their own community. Trevor has shown us this. Um, on the other hand, many see TikTok as the space where white youth steal those dances and profit from them. And while this is perhaps an oversimplification because there are numerous popular black dancers on TikTok as well, I can't help but see a very clear parallel to the last century of American vernacular dances uh, in the United States, especially on media platforms. 
In fact, TikTok restages the same processes of mainstreaming black vernacular dances via white bodies that has gone on in every previous generation via a different medium. So in the jazz era, it was Charleston and Lindy Hop on film. At mid-century, it was rock and roll dances like The Twist on TV. And now it's hip hop dances like The Dougie, The Woe, The Wave, The Dab, etc. And they're online. So in every case, a mass medium was the means through which white folks made money performing the dances created by black folks. With its time and space constraints, TikTok offers a literally condensed version of this same phenomenon. So to conclude, I want to suggest that short form, short form video apps bear a great deal of continuity with older media when it comes to their circulation of popular dance and the politics thereof. But at the same time, they offer new constraints that help to shape that dance into something very much of the pandemic moment. So thank you. Alex, should I stop share? I'm assuming yes. Yes, thank you. Wow, thank you all um, so much to think about. Um, so I guess I just wanted to start um, uh, with this question of uh, platform specificity, but also as we saw in almost everybody's um, presentation, there's also a uh, real cross platform and cross, cross medium um, experience where we have, uh, right, a video game on YouTube, on TikTok, um, and Dub Smash sharing, Dub Smash as a company sharing via Instagram. Um, so I was just hoping that you um, could continue to think about this out loud for us. Um, on one hand, TikTok has such primacy right now, and I think is perhaps unique uh, TikTok and Dub Smash both for being uh, dance first. Um, as, as Crystal pointed out, the um, mode through which um, things become famous is through the sound. But in terms of, I think, a mental association, I think dance would be the first, um, the first place uh, element in the family feud answer of what does TikTok, what is TikTok famous for? What is Dub Smash famous for? Which is not the case of other short form um, video platforms or even YouTube, despite the fact that dance does have a, a large real estate in all of those. Um, so I guess I'm just interested in this um, fact that these platforms are so dance forward, but nonetheless still circulate and still in some ways need the um, pre-existing uh, platforms that predated them and that predated sort of the pandemic moment. So I'll jump in because uh, what you said, I did two things and what Pamela said reminded me of this is a lot of popular TikTok trends are actually long form Vine trends, right? That are being recycled, right? But um, back to your point, Alex, something that I noticed with my students and a lot of the teenagers I work with is they're hyper aware of the different platforms and what works well in those platforms. So for instance, my students and I, they'll say, let's make a dub smash and we'll make a dub smash and then we'll make the same exact song and dance on TikTok, but we change the, our face. What, what Chuyun was saying, like exactly it. Our face dancing is different. Um, the dance goes less hard, right? It's simplified. Um, it's more playful, right? And so it's just amazing to me, like these, you know, young people are super aware of what the systems, right? That everyone's talking about in a very scholarly way, but they're aware of it in a very like, hey, I just want to get more followers kind of way. I'll follow up. Oh, no, go Crystal. I was going to say this isn't really about their lineages through platforms, right? Because we can see in places like Vine and YouTube and elsewhere the sort of seeds of this, but I'm actually interested in where it's going next. Um, which is hilarious because it's the opposite of what I just said I do as a historian, but bear with me. Um, my students, so I teach a global music video course and my students last quarter were like really excited to talk about the influence of TikTok on music video because, and so for those of you who don't know, the Doja Cat song Say So um, became wildly popular in one of these dance trends 
and the yeah and Trevor's like ready to do it um and the the dance actually like created by this young zoomer she was like 16 or something at the time then actually got incorporated into the official music video for the song which is of course on YouTube and everywhere now um and I believe the young woman was invited to be in the video with Doja Cat if I if I remember correctly so yeah I'm, I'm thinking also not only like what feeds into TikTok but also what comes out the other end so I just wanted to bring that up Thanks, Pam. Um, I wanted to reflect on two things, the cultural specificity. So I probably forgot to mention I'm an anthropologist by training. And a lot of what I do involves me meeting with people in the flesh to see what they do when they make things for social media. And I was just thinking if I were to go to any of my informants in the Asia Pacific region, which is where I focus my expertise on, and ask them, what is TikTok for? Or what is Dub Smash for? Um, I dare say that none of them are going to list dance within the top three things for this region, at least, or for the demographic of young people I've been looking at. So let's say looking at um, TikTok in East Asia, speaking to any of my Chinese informants, they want to think about TikTok or rather they use TikTok as a legacy of its predecessor app, Douyin, that came out a year ago. And therefore for them, TikTok is a way to perform makeup transitions and shock people that a face that woke up like this can look drop dead gorgeous with some transitions or for fashion. And there is a legacy there of that cross-platforming from something domestic and them using TikTok to go global. If I were to ask my informants in Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore, what Dub Smash was for, for them it would be skits and voiceovers where they would mimic actors, they would be very um, subversive and cheeky with their parodies and trying to make humor um, as a vehicle to talk about political critique. And that is a legacy of these peoples in countries where they need to learn to circumvent state censorship. These are countries where something that is borderline dissident would end you up in a police station for questioning. But doing so in the vehicle of humor and depth smash, that passes off as frivolity at any time. So yes, dance does happen there, but when I think about the core uses of dances here, they are different. The core differences are two. One, a lot of the young people on TikTok use dance as a way to get noticed by the algorithm and for other people to see them on the For You page. So you will often see young people performing great dances, but in the captions, in the text layover, in their speech, they outrightly tell you, I'm doing this so the algorithm puts me on your FYP, and now that I've got your attention, here's what I want to say. So they're very aware that dance is the popular media or format that gets them seated onto people's screens. That's one. The second way I'm seeing dance use as like a, a background vehicle traveler is through this concept of refracted publics, where young people believe that if it's just a young woman dancing scandally clad, the algorithm is just going to pass you by. It's just one of the other kids doing these things. But then in your dialogue, you're talking about genocide, racism, all the state abuse that you believe TikTok's going to remove from the platform, if not for the fact that your fancy trendy dance is helping mask this from the machine algorithmic eye. So I would say that there are a lot of young people not in the dance sphere who are aware of the value of it, the popularity, the trend, and then using that social capital to embed their messages there as well. Thank you for adding that complexity. Yeah, I think the regional differences is really important. And I'm glad you brought that up, Crystal. I did a talk in the UK on Wednesday. I also do work on musical theater in TikTok. And the musicals that were popular in the UK were very different than the ones that are popular here, even though the canon is the same, like the actual Broadway canon is the same, but the ones that the algorithm pushes out to UK people is different than the ones that happen in the US. And yeah, I just love that you brought that up. Bridgerton, yes. Um, I also want to really quick, um, so I was born in South Korea and I was able to visit my family in South Korea last, last semester because I was teaching online. And because my research is about K-pop and also social media, I ended up again like stuck at home, ended up watching a lot of TikTok videos. And something I noticed was that the for, for you suggestion videos on TikTok 
was actually dramatically different from the videos suggested in the United States. Um, so I'm not an algorithm study scholar, but I think the spectatorship and also the audience reception of dance is, I think we might need to collaborate with someone like in the engineering department or some other field in order to get a better idea of how our understanding of um, popular trend is actually manipulated by something um, beyond our, our human um, level of expectation. I wanted to ask a question actually. I wanted to ask, so who creates the logarithm? Next to come first topic. <laughs> Dr. Bencho about that. Yeah, I mean, this is a very important question, and I think a question that's increasingly being handled in, in internet um, in internet studies, uh, questions about algorithmic bias and who, who is, in fact, making those decisions and um, who's training the AI who, who is making those decisions, um, but, of course, has no um, intelligence outside of people who pro program it. Um, I have read that there's speculation that the algorithm on TikTok does focus heavily on facial recognition um, and also perhaps reads body movement, um, which I think the, the um, results of that, those facts have been discussed by, by many of you. Um, did anyone wanna add anything to this topic? Oh, I'll just bring up, um, I, I also am not an algorithm studies scholar, so don't know much about algorithms, but I, I'm interested in discourses uh, around these things. Um, some of you were at the last Dance Studies Association conference in the last in-person one. I talked a lot about the discourses around Fortnite dances. Um, and so that sort of, that fed me into TikTok actually. And um, what I'm noticing about the discourse around the algorithm, right? So what users are saying, is um, that it shadow bans fat people, disabled people, right? Like anyone who doesn't fit the sort of normative notion of who's gonna look attractive on the, on the, on the For You page. Um, and so I follow a number of creators who fit into one or more of those categories or identify with one or more of those categories. And they will post, you know, a bunch of really great dances that a lot of people like, um, but they just won't get the traction. And so then they'll post about like, you know, y'all aren't ready for the conversation about shadow banning, right? Something like that. So I get the sense that even though we don't really have a lot of information about the creation of that algorithm, there's definitely a lot of discourse amongst users speaking it. Yeah, and I mean, if you look at just the the top, say, 50 creators on TikTok, right, like the most followed people, they're mostly attractive, I'm using air quotes if you're not watching, um, white teenagers or young white people or people that fit into Western beauty standards and whiteness, you know, even if they're people of color, they're still um, having skin, like white skin privilege, right? And so it kind of goes exactly with what we're talking about, right? Yeah, I have nothing else to add. I don't know anything about algorithms either. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's okay to chime in. Um, there is a chapter in my forthcoming TikTok book that looks at algorithmic folklore. So all of this discussion is making my ears peak and tingle and making me very happy. Um, it is true, we know very little, but what we do know from research is that TikTok operates very differently in specific country markets. So from the information of how they break into these different country markets and the information they reveal to their partners, like social media firms that they're cooperating with or agencies that they are working with to seed influencers and the first generation of users in the app, we do know some things about the algorithm. For instance, we know that from the way TikTok entered the South Korean market, they cooperated mostly with K-pop companies. And when you see a lot of people doing dances based on these K-pop songs, it's because the very first batch of them started there. 
when we learn of how TikTok broke into the Japanese market, they basically mass harvested these humorous high school creators from Vine. And therefore, it seems like that is the most popular genre and people who want to get noticed there perform this in the belief that the algorithm is looking for more and more humor. So the origin story, I think, of every country market shapes what people believe the algorithm is looking for. But there is an entire layer of expertise on TikTok on TikTok where they're marketers, people you can pay to teach you how to maximize um, traction in your page that swear upon using a combination of songs, um, usually signed with artists within a one week window. They believe also that if you like and engage in a specific time slot, you are going to be able to be more seen. So we do see a lot of mutual following, a lot of mutual collaborations with specific high key influences there. Um, and there are also TikTokers who do a day in a live trend. So they would try a practice every day, check this for 100 days, 300 days, and come up and say, try it and test it based on a sample size on one. TikTok likes A, B, C, and hates one, two, three. Now, as much as all of this is folklore, if enough people do it, it just becomes a common norm or a practice. And that's how it generally works. If many people yeah. believe this thing, it just becomes truth. Wow. Um, and that kind of takes the, power, takes the power away from the platform coming in to say yes or no. Yeah. Interesting. Wow, it's interesting. So somebody could be like an algorithm, like sabotager. <laughs> and then create a new folklore saying, if you do such and such and so and so, and then so now all those people will start doing it. Oh, so that's very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. I, I have lots more questions, but I wanna make sure that we get to the audience. So let's um, open up to them. And then if there is time, I can circle back. Um, so, uh, Harmony, is there uh, anything from the chat you want to start with? Yeah, so there's a question um, that maybe you can start circling around as I unspotlight everybody so that we can see each other's faces. Um, but there's a there's a question about um, uh, appropriation uh, and dissemination and how um, how uh, kids who engage in TikTok or engage in Dub Smash um, kind of become aware of the processes of dissemination and appropriation. I think we've talked a little bit, like there's some uh, speculation about the algorithm and, and learning uh, some aspects of, of that. But I, I think that we can also push that question of appropriation a little bit further too. I'd be curious to hear more on that. And I'm gonna remove your spotlights. Um, I will say the, I mean, I mostly, my book is mostly about black teenage dancers, black teen girls, and they, and my students and young people I'm around, they are hyper aware of this conversation. Um, they are very much aware that someone like Jalea Harmon can create a dance, Renegade, and then Charlie D'Amelio can get, you know, okay, now I'm like spotlighted on myself. I don't like it. Um, it's too big. No. But uh, they're very aware of this conversation, how white teens are able to do, to gain things from doing the same exact, they're able to appropriate trends and monetize them and so on and so forth. Um, but what I noticed when I was kind of doing this TikTok anthropological ethnography sort of work, right, is that the comments in these videos and in these conversations, or for instance on Instagram, the TikTok Shade Room is a popular account that post all the like drama, it spills the tea. And the, it's very much drawn by racial lines. Like it's divided by racial lines where white or white presenting teens and young people are saying, this isn't a big deal. It's just TikTok, it's just a dance. If we're just having fun. And then mostly you're, you know, people of color, um, largely black, you know, young people are saying, no, this is not um, just fun. This is not just a TikTok dance, this is actually our livelihood and you're taking away our opportunities and just like someone here said it maybe a few people said it it mimics you know this like legacy of uh whiteness winning right i'm using air quotes again if you're not watching me and so i'm gonna stop there but yeah i think they're very aware something i i wanted to add to the conversation on appropriation is just um 
and also the reason for me wanting to go back to pre-colonialness is just at some point, you know, these kinds of things that are bringing us all together globally, at some point, it, I've, I'm hoping it will bring the adults to say, we should probably address racism. Like we should probably address this, put it in curriculum, we need to undo this racism, undo anti-blackness, because this is only it's only in every part of life at this point, you know? It's in everything. There's not anything where these kinds of conversations in terms of that question of appropriation is happening. Like um, not, and then the nuances depending on the race, that is where it's happening with it. Like this new global community that is going is coming about like so quickly and it is going to require new conversations. One of the things that um, happened with like the dance I'm talking about, Jerusalem, that was different was because it was a shared experience of the pandemic and the twin toxic trauma. So the pandemic and the George Floyd um, we were sharing this feeling of like, okay, I don't get to move social distancing. So you had every kind of person, people in wheelchair chairs did the challenge, people from in Mexican folklorico costumes did the challenge, people in Ireland did the challenge. So we shared um we shared a meaning and then did a dance. So that's not quite appropriation. And that kind of thing can happen on TikTok, which I think is beautiful. But the other part of this um globalization that we're experiencing, it, it requires us to um, take it one step further for scholars to do deeper research and finding out ways because of the scholar's voice is so powerful to like undo some of this mess, you know. I just wanted to add that. Sina, did that answer your question or do you wanna um, uh, uh, unmute yourself and, and follow up in any way? Oh, thanks, Harmony. Um, I never get my question right in the chat. It always, it always gets, I'm like, no, that's not what I meant. Um, yeah, I, I guess what, I literally just interviewed my own daughter for a podcast about TikTok and as, you know, using her as like a, an expert in a certain way. And it kept, she kept surprising me because I kept telling the stories of appropriation and the fact that this has been going on forever, like what Pamela was talking about, that it's just a repeat in different media or different platforms of these same processes of white folks uh, appropriating black cultural forms and then making bank off them and that. And I expected her to somehow be surprised about that or not have known that. And yet she was like, oh yeah, right. The renegade dance wasn't actually made by Charlie D'Amelio and she got all the help for it. And then the, and you know, we, and then another time something similar, she, the Doja Cat story or whatever, she knows, she knows about, well, the Doja Cat story is different, but um, she knows about these uh, problematic processes. And, I, and, and I'm trying to figure out, is she, how is she coming to understand that? Is it happening within the platform itself or in some other way? That was my question. So, and it had nothing to do with algorithms because I don't understand algorithms. Thank you. Thanks, Seema. I think if I can summarize this, social justice is cool on TikTok. If we think back on, let's say the predecessor apps, Vine, the top creators on Vine were humorous, comedic people who had great editing skills. Instagram has been overtaken by fashion influencers. You look glamorous, you spend five hours curating a post, adjusting everything in your backdrop. For a Gen Z on TikTok, social justice pursuits, call out cultures, that is definitely a key platform norm. And I read about that in one of the articles that linked to in the chat. So for this reason, oftentimes posts that go viral are just calling people out on the one hand, this means that a lot of minority creators, certainly in Australia, indigenous creators often get their voices heard. They make noise and they challenge when white bodies claim to represent them because they can speak for themselves in an app that allows them to communicate directly with someone. One of the beauties of the TikTok algorithm is that anyone can go viral for just about anything. My favorite example is this elderly man from Europe. He's in his 70s and he accidentally recorded himself and uploaded a three second clip just looking confused on TikTok. 
10 million views in two days because everyone found geriatric people very cute on the app. He's just an outlier there. So this leveling, um, the level on TikTok is the, the chance that anything and everyone might be able to go viral. That said though, um, on the negative side of this, there are also a lot of TikTokers who are now then commodifying or um, taking advantage of social justice by bandwagoning. They may not know a lot about an issue, but they will come out and say, all men are bad. Feminism is real. White bodies should keep quiet. And if you interrogate them in the comments, many of these TikTokers don't really know what you're saying. They don't really know what you're talking about. If they have the very prolific TikTokers though, they take attention and they pilfer the algorithm sorting and people's attention away from the people who know what they're saying. So it's become trendy, almost like a badge you wear. Uh, it's a badge of honor to say, I've got one viral video saying racism, is bad and that's enough whereas there are lots of people actually doing a lot of work behind the scenes so yeah plus and negatives for the platform in this area yeah. I'll, I'll follow up and and say that um you know in case it's too depressing uh, i want to say one um perhaps positive movement i've noticed which is and this is sort of piggybacking on uh seema's interview with her own daughter is that the the great thing about the july Harmon renegade issue is that it it was very public right like there was there were a lot of people who bandwagoned with her in order to make her complaints visible. The New York Times did a big piece, right? There were she was on Ellen, right? So once once it became big enough, culture in general was like, this is bad. We can't have this happening, even though it had been happening for a while and will continue to happen with other creators. Mm -hmm. But as a result of that, one thing that I noticed, and folks can back me up um, if they also noticed it, is there is an increased trend in giving dance credit on TikTok that didn't used to be there, right? So Dub Smash, Instagram, they had cultures of crediting the original creator of the dance. TikTok did not. And then in the sort of aftermath of the Jaliah Harmon Renegade incident, um, there has been a larger trend of people giving a DC in their, um, in their little captions and when they don't people call them out and say where's your dance credit right and you know who's whose is this and they'll throw they'll throw up the tag of the person who did create it so i as a community i think they are trying to correct a little bit for some of some of those problems that's spot on and i find um it also you know with tiktok the the big creators set the tone right and so once all that happened uh, Charlie D'Amelio, Addison Ray, Easterling, so on and so forth, they began to give the dance credit, uh, which slowly, or I guess not slowly, but it changed the app culture. And the other thing I'll say, though, is by the time, I guess it was March, so we're talking two months after the Renegade story blew up, uh, when Savage came out, the Savage Challenge, Kiara Wilson, um, she was immediately credited. She immediately had a blue check on Instagram, on TikTok. She had an agent immediately. She had merchandise. Megan the Stallion was tweeting about it. Uh, and it was this night and day difference from what, you know, Jalea Harmon had experienced. Um, and the other thing I'll add about the dance credit is a lot of creators will, will now in the caption or in the first comment, they'll even say like, hey, who created this dance? On TikTok, you can't edit it. But on Instagram, like I'll do it. I'll post who made this dance and then people tell me, right? And then I will update the, the dance credit, right? So to give that credit. Um, and then I'll say one more thing. Journalists have kind of, or I guess, I don't know if it's social media journalists or TikTok journalists, what we're calling it, but they have recognized this. And so anything that goes viral, if you Google it now, there's automatically an article. There's some, someone has written an article about it that gives you a very clear lineage of how that trend uh, became viral, right? And so that's a very different thing than what we we're dealing with a year ago, a little more than a year ago. I, I, sorry for interrupting you, Trevor. Um, I just want to add one thing really quick. I think I agree with all um, all the presenters' ideas, and I just want to. Um, I think it'll be also useful to differentiate finding implications in this fast-changing social media world versus um, celebrating 
or glamorizing social media trend because what I also notice is that the lifespan of a viral dance video is really short. So think about, so TikTok has been here like two years, but I cannot even count how many viral dance videos and influencers are out there. So that means in the next few years, maybe the viral video itself doesn't necessarily mean anything because anything can go viral. And the other thing I notice is the, the dancers become younger, but they look so mature. So something is alarming to me is the um, explicit commodification of young girls and their bodies, mm -hmm. which again has very short lifespan. So I think um, I don't want to like um, throw away like all the negative comments at the end, but I think it, it, it might be also useful for us to see the um, the consequences of the fame and how the younger generation is programmed to just to want to be star, but not that that doesn't always work that way. And as an academic and as a teacher, what can we do um, when we are maybe guiding students, including mm -hmm. dance majors? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One thing I want to add why we do um, the Back to the Roots series is was a response to all of the people who now want to wind their hips, you know, talking about this kind of sexualized body, then this, um, this winding of the hips in pre-colonial African cosmology means a lot of things that are not exactly sexual that you will, it kind of gets extracted out as it becomes viral and this trend. And then along with this becomes this kind of sexualized over made up. And now it's marketed like this whole commodified body. And so that is uh, a problem. I hear what you're saying. I would agree with that. And in, in the case of my research, that's why uh, we do this online series and we're going to create curriculum around it so that people understand what, what your winding hips might mean in that particular um, reference, like that it means something more and it, it'll teach people to look at the body different for and for people, for women to even imagine themselves different. But like that pool of glamour of virals and likes, you know, it's... Um, and the access that kids have to it is something that is like when people used to talk about what magazines did in terms of like these airbrushed models and everybody striving for this false sense of perfection, you know, viral videos have had that effect too. So once again, I appreciate you raising that point. Um, switching gears, maybe there's a question in the chat and um, apo apologies if I mispronounce your name uh, from Juan Yamas Rodriguez, um, who asks, following up on Pamela's comments about platform affordances, I'd be interested to hear the panelists, dis uh, the panelists talk about whether and how the fact that TikTok dances are recorded on a mobile device allow for dynamic stagings like the hashtag love story challenge that includes camera movement. So thinking uh, about the affordance affordances of the, the camera as a mobile camera and thinking more uh, in terms of image creation and the cinematic uh, aspects or the image aspects. I'm going to start because Juan is a colleague of mine um, and we're about to be on a workshop together in a few more days so I'm shocked that he came to this he's going to have too much of me um, and uh, I the love story is exactly the challenge that I was thinking about when I said usually the camera doesn't move because for those of you who aren't familiar um, it's uh, like a chunk of a Taylor Swift song that's been remixed um, and there's a key moment where um, one is supposed to push the camera away so that it can pull back and, and make this sort of dramatic moment. And, and then there's like the hip thrusts that follow and make it make it screen dance. Um, and uh, I, I wonder why there isn't more of that other than like, you know, it's another step of effort required. You know, Crystal brought up at the very beginning um, that there's different levels of, you know, in terms of creation, people have different levels of skill sets um, when manipulating all the millions of possible edits and filters and whatnot in TikTok and, and similar apps. So I wonder if it's just that one extra barrier to entry that makes it less common, but um, I'm happy to hear from my colleagues about this one because it's also something I'm interested in. 
I find the um, love story challenge, which was one that like I could not watch without laughing. Uh, but the ones that, um, again, I find that the viral, the ones that I came across, the viralness of them matched the, the beauty aesthetics, right? Because again, any teenage boy that was doing it or young, like 20 something dude who was doing it, the transition hits and their shirt's off, right? And they have a six pack. And I'm like, I don't know what that is. I don't know where you find that. Um, I've never seen one. Um, and then of course the comments encourage this conversation about the attractiveness of that that person right um or it's something really funny where it's like an attractive woman and when the transition hits she's in um like a hot dog costume or something you know uh where it's like ridiculous and so then the comments are about the ridiculousness right so it's provoking some sort of conversation i think this boils down to persona um, so far from our last two, from Pam and Trevor, um, we are rethinking the body on social media as in the Instagram era, where you look a specific way and you pass um, and you get seen by the algorithm or by human eyes, or you look a specific way and you're intentionally self-deprecating in your hot dog costume and people like that. Um, but there are a lot of other varieties of this sort of performance on TikTok that do not lend themselves to such personas. We've got elderly people doing regular everyday elderly things like cooking in the kitchen and then talking to you about health or war times. You've got people who used to do knitting on Twitch now showing you knitting on TikTok and then guilt tripping you into supporting their small businesses. So if we remove the body from the equation, I don't think that is the central source of capital for many other genres of TikTok. But if we consider the body in the equation, then there are also this underbelly cultures where people ally with the underdog or the black sheep. And a lot of your cultural capital on the app is linked to the fat body, the disabled body, and people want to see more of that. They interact with more of such content just to disrupt the Instagram bodies who are pilfering on the platform. Uh, infiltrating the platform. So I feel like it's difficult for us to talk about what's mainstream on TikTok and what isn't because we all live in different TikTok worlds. Even mm -hmm. me and the person in the room next to me, we're not even going to have the same FYP. And that intentional design from this app makes it such that we can never have a fruitful conversation about what's mm -hmm. um, the underbelly or what's minority, except for when we can prove that these creators have been censored, shadow banned, have got their contents removed, have got a warning notification. So a recent movement on TikTok by a lot of creators is to ask um, the company ByteDance to be transparent with their moderation policy. Because it seems like in some countries, just merely mentioning the word algorithm in your captions gets you removed. In some other country markets, if you talk about the government, that gets you removed. In some other country markets, showing something that is similar to nipples and coloration, even if you're just wearing a t-shirt, gets you removed. And then in some other countries, you get full-blown child pedophilia, exploitation, mutilation, and gore viral. Um, and that standard of mm -hmm. moderation is something that we can push the company to be more transparent with. If not, I feel we'll always be in this box of like guessing. Yeah. That's my contribution. You are awesome. <laughs> Information is awesome. I guess uh, just to wrap up, um, if you don't mind, I, I had a thought, which is sort of bringing all these things together. Um, I, I think that there's this really interesting um, connection between this appropriation question and the platform affordances. And um, as many of you noted, the emphasis on sort of above the knee and face um, emphasis, which um, allows the persona to be a particular um, focus, but also has this really fascinating um, component of eliminating some of the parts of the body that we associate most with movement that we would class as Africanist. So the knee bend that uh, Kelly showed us the image of, you can't hardly even see um, in most uh, TikTok videos and also then videos on other platforms that are being influenced by that highly constrained um, movement. So we have a really specific movement style that's 
predicated on the technological um, components. And that sort of continues to reinforce um, a change in the performance itself. Um, so I, I want to thank you all for a wonderful conversation. I wish we could talk for another hour. Um, we will be posting this recording and I hope we can um, continue these conversations on Twitter. Um, and I can't wait to read all of these books also. <laughs> um, so thank you for sharing everyone. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you.